Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar on the uh, one of the Spire Challenge webinar series on the Connected Fleet Challenge. Uh, my name is Nilu Parvinashtiani and I will help facilitate today's webinar. So uh, this webinar is hosted by the National Operations Center of Excellence or NOCO. Uh, we are in the business of supporting uh, transportation system management and operations. Um, so there are a few ways you could connect to us. Uh, first of all, uh, you can check out our website and also um, our newsletter and uh, the and the Twitter account that we have for the upcoming webinars and any TISMO related uh, news. Also, also please uh, connect to our YouTube channel so you are the first uh, to know about our webinar recordings. Um, so uh, here on your screen you can see the download slide resources, that is the PDF version of today's webinar. Um, so feel free to download those. This will be available to do and now at the beginning and also at the end of the webinar. Um, so let me cover a few logistics before uh, we start us off uh, with the webinar. All the lines are muted, but uh, I'm going to ask you to put your questions in the question and discussion part. And I'll make that available in a second. Um, also, uh, this webinar is recorded, so the uh, the recording will be available as a video on our website, and also that will be sent to you in a follow-up email. Um, so uh, let me cover the agenda now. So we'll start us off uh, with a welcome and an introduction from Blaine Leonard from Utah DOT, who will go over just uh, the SPAT Challenge webinar series and the SPAT Challenge itself. And uh, once he's done with that, uh, we'll have Mark Coco from Pennsylvania DOT, who has a two-part presentation. First, he will talk about uh, his experience at PennDOT with uh, deploying uh, SPAT Challenge and making it operational in their state. And then that will be followed with the Connected Fleet Challenge overview that he has um, as the second part of his presentation. So that will be followed with uh, Blaine Leonard's presentation on the equipping transit fleet vehicles with overuse in Utah. And then we'll have the Q&A. So at Q&A, I will um, read each question out loud and will uh, direct it to Blaine or Marco or both of them if that was appropriate. So with that, uh, let me hand it over to Blaine to start us off with the webinar. Thank you, Nilo. It's a great to have everybody on today. Appreciate everybody joining us uh, in a mid-August busy time of year. We appreciate you being online. Um, if you've been on these webinars before, you know we sort of start out with a little um, introduction, description of what's going on in the SPAT Challenge. Um, SPAT Challenge, of course, is a, a challenge to all of the public sector transportation infrastructure owners and operators uh, to deploy DSRC in their locations at about 20 intersections in each state uh, by 2020. So 20 and 50 by 20 is sort of the, the catchphrase. You can see here uh, the map of those locations, the green pins, are places that are uh, in some stage of planning or development of their deployment. The blue pins show those places that have completed their deployment and they're broadcasting SPAD and MAP. If you um, pay really close attention, and you, and you may not notice this, there's an extra pin there that wasn't there last time we talked. We've now got 36 locations in 26 states. So um, that represents a fair number of our issues, and we're excited about that. Um, and. Um, We'd love to have some more pins on there for those of you that are that are moving towards this. Um, the slide says there are six webinars conducted to date. I should have changed that slide. Today's the eighth. We've had seven prior to today. Uh, and as Nilo said, these are all being recorded. And individual presentations in each webinar are recorded. So you can go to the website, and I'll show you that in a minute. And you can get access uh, to all this material in the past. 
Um, and these website, these uh, webinars included sort of a, an overview and, and some general system engineering material back in March. We've been doing this for quite a while. Some design considerations um, in uh, March and April. A real focused discussion of a map creator tool that, um, that FHWA has available in April. Um, and then some more design considerations about RSU specs and backhaul and licensing in May. Um, we had a discussion about how we should deploy uh, and then validate our messages um, in June. And then we started looking at some operational deployments. And we looked at three of those uh, in our July webinar, the seventh webinar, uh, one in Las Vegas, uh, one in Virginia, and then ours here in Utah. And today, later on, I'll talk a little bit more about that deployment, but really with a focus on onboard units. Um, if you go to the SPAT Challenge website, and the address is there on the top, the National Operations Center of Excellence hosts this page um, and all these pages. Um, there is um, a resource tab, and you can see down here on the bottom the uh, little blue-green arrow points to the location where these webinars are, are found. And I'm sure you've all been there because you've registered for today's webinar. Um, if you are pursuing the SPAT Challenge and we don't have a pin for you, we would certainly like to know that. Here's a little bit of information we would like from you listed on this slide and the address where you can send that. We'd love to get some more pins up there and show the increased interest in what's going on with the SPAT Challenge. Um, you'll notice on this research page where we have a bunch of documents you can download to help you with, with licensing information or implementation guidance or whatever else it might be, that there's a new resource up here. It's the SPAT Procurement Resource. Uh, we've put it up within the last month or so, and it has some procurement documents in it. A lot of people have been asking for those. There's only two or three here. Um, we'd love some more examples. If you and your agency have some you'd like to share with us, um, and, and these are all a little bit different depending on how the agencies take their, um, do their procurements and what kind of details they're looking for. And so um, these are good resource documents for you. I wouldn't recommend you use any of them verbatim, and things change over time. So um, at least one of these is a little bit older. So, uh, but that resource is now available, and I wanted to point that out to folks that were, that were looking for things. Um, today's the eighth webinar, and, and after today, we thought we would take a little bit of a break, and then, um, and then in a couple of months, we would start a, a less frequent series of webinars where we really focus on operational deployments, key lessons learned, and maybe updates on evolving topics. So we think there's still more to learn and more to share. We're going to get a little less frequent with them, um, and uh, hopefully you'll be able to join us on some of these subsequent webinars starting probably in October. Um, and we would love to hear from you about what these topics um, ought to be and uh, sites you'd like to hear from, things that you've heard about or things that you're working on that you'd like to share. We'd love to hear about all of those things. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, the next one will probably be in October. And we've already lined up three or four agencies to talk about some of their operational deployments and lessons learned. So we'd encourage you to register for that and come back to us in late October and, uh, and talk some more about the SPAT Challenge. So that's our introduction today. Um, and um, again, I appreciate everybody being on. Um, we're now going to turn the time over to Mark Kopko, and Mark's going to talk about some of the good work they've been doing in Pennsylvania. Mark? Thanks, Blaine. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you're at. Uh, my name is Mark Kopko. I'm the Advanced Vehicle Technology Manager for the Pennsylvania Department of Transportation. So everything that relates to connecting automated vehicles falls underneath me. So today I'm going to do a, a two-part presentation. The first part is basically going over uh, what we've done in, in Pennsylvania, some lessons learned, and what we have coming down the pike. And then the second part is to talk about the, uh, the proposed Connected Fleet Challenge, which is designed to be a follow-up to the SPAT Challenge. So in Pennsylvania, uh, we have, uh, we've, been, we've been working in the connected vehicle realm uh, for several years. This map just gives you an overview of, of current initiatives and planned. So uh, high level, we have roughly 54 connected intersections throughout the state. Uh, in the next five years, we have an additional roughly 210 planned for deployment. Predominantly, they're located in the Pittsburgh region, uh, in the city, and in neighboring suburbs. But we also have uh, deployments in Harrisburg and then uh, planned deployments in the Philadelphia region. 
So with the planned deployments, and, and to give you an idea of the existing, so in Pittsburgh, uh, predominantly along the smart spine system of the city. So that would be the routes that are highlighted in blue. So we have existing signals in the western part of the city, but going forward by uh, 2022, we expect to have an additional 45 to 75 connected signals along those uh, blue corridors on this map. In the Philadelphia region, we'll have an additional 160 uh, connected intersections. That will be happening on the uh, pink routes that are basically running parallel to the I-76 Schuylkill Expressway. Uh, this is part of a larger active corridor management program. We also are uh, creating a, uh, a, a, a testing facility in partnership with the Pennsylvania Turnpike and uh, Penn State University. So within this facility, we'll also have some simulated uh, signalized intersections. So it'll be uh, four uh, signalized intersections in this facility. Uh, plus, we'll be deploying uh, uh, roadside units for curve speed warnings, uh, rail grade crossings, uh, tying into tolling applications. Uh, we'll have a laboratory setting. We'll be using uh, RSUs and OBUs in a controlled setting for uh, interoperability testing and then just initial testing of applications before we roll out to a live environment that now that we have a, a location that can be controlled testing. And we're going to try and be communication agnostic on this facility. So uh, we'll be looking at DSRC and any type of other communication spectrum. So this facility will be opening up uh, uh, by 2022. But the big thing that we wanted to talk to about our existing deployments, we, we wanted to highlight our, our Harrisburg deployment. Uh, to give you some background, uh, we wanted to do a demonstration back in, um, in uh, 2016 for uh, members of our uh, legislature or state legislature to give them an understanding of connecting automated vehicles. So uh, Carnegie Mellon brought up their automated vehicle to, uh, the, to the Capitol and was going to give rides to roughly about 50 members of the General Assembly around the Capitol complex. Uh, however, we wanted to make sure that you know, safety was uh, of the utmost, so uh, to allow for redundancy we equipped the signalized intersection so that you would have that extra communications with the automated vehicle. Um, it wasn't necessary, but it's just there that uh, it just makes everyone more comfortable. It's something CMU wanted, and it's something that we agreed upon. Uh, the other nice thing about this is since our office is located right next to the Capitol, our, uh, our central office, this gives us an area where we actually have a, a proving ground, a, a test bed right outside our door. We don't have to go out to the Pittsburgh region or Philadelphia in the future to test anything. We have something right outside. So it just gave us a, a great opportunity, and we thought this would be a, a something to use and, and to build off of. So one of the unique things about our deployment, to the best of our knowledge, it's still the fastest deployment from concept to actual uh, deployment done by a public agency. So we, we did it, uh, had it all up and operational from the time we basically wrote it on a, a whiteboard, throwing a you know, concept out there to see if it would stick, to actually having something in the field deployed in, in eight weeks. Um, so this just gives you an idea of the timeline. We started in, in August of 2016, uh, brought people on board to do basic con ops, field view, uh, start getting quotes. Uh, we had a kickoff meeting. Uh, purchased the units. Uh, they arrived two weeks later. Uh, we uh, you know, had to do some modifications to the, the, the traffic controllers. We did testing, and then by week nine, we, everything was in place after those initial tests, and we were doing demonstrations for the governor and, and key members of the General Assembly. So this just gives you an idea of the partners that were involved. Um, so we worked with RADA and Lear now. Um, uh, for the actual roadside units, uh, the vehicle that Carnegie Mellon brought out had a, a RADA onboard unit, so it just worked out just to make sure you had interoperability between. Um, we also worked with the, the city, the university, and then you can see the suppliers, the, the traffic control manufacturer, uh, the consulting firms that helped out. So this map will show you basically uh, where the signalized intersections were equipped. So there's eight of them all around the Capitol complex. So the Capitol is right by the, the staging area that's signed off. And basically, for these demonstrations, we did a, uh, a clockwise a loop around the Capitol complex. So one of the things that we, uh, we had to quick deal with is just ownership issues. Uh, although the, the city didn't, or although the, the DUT didn't necessarily own any of the signals, uh, some were actually on state routes. Uh, some were on city routes, and then some were actually owned by the Department of General Services. 
So that was something that we, we didn't really initially think about, uh, you know, just how to start bringing groups outside of, you know, transportation realm when you start to get into the Department of General uh, Services because they uh, control the capital complex. So just quick getting stakeholder meetings on board, getting them all up to speed on uh, what we were actually doing, what does that entail, what has to be in place to make it work. Uh, that was an interesting concept. Um, to give you an idea about the signals, uh, as I mentioned, the city owns all the signals. Uh, they were upgraded to brand new McCain ATC X controllers. Uh, however, we still had to do some firmware upgrades on top of that. Uh, all the ROTA units were ERATAs. Uh, at the time, uh, we didn't have any fiber backhaul. Uh, that was recently just put in place here, so it was twisted pair. So we didn't have a communications back to a central location, so we had to keep going out to individual controllers and, and making any changes we needed to do or verify everything was operational. We couldn't do anything remotely. And uh, that ended up being a struggle because you know, we were constantly just moving around, especially for demonstration purposes, making sure everything was operational. Uh, since then, we, we do have fiber backhaul in place, and now we are working towards integrating that back into our actual uh, command and control systems and uh, existing networks. Uh, from the deployment side, uh, a big help was working with uh, CMU since they've done uh, work with connected deployments, uh, with RSU uh, placements. Uh, we also had a contractor that had some experience in radio frequency expertise, uh, so they helped us determine the best optimal placement based off the route that we were doing uh, to get the, the most out of the actual roadside units. We did all the configuration uh, as much as we could before we put everything in place just to save time. And initially, we didn't have any map messages. Uh, we didn't have time to go out and survey everything. So everything was actually integrated into the uh, CMU uh, automated vehicle. So that's where all the map messages were being controlled. So they had everything LIDAR mapped out uh, pre-demonstration. And then we just had to start tying in the uh, the actual SPAT message uh, into you know, specific lanes and, and signal states in that way. So some of the lessons learned at the time, um, you know, this is predates the SPAT challenge, um, but you know, we, we thought this would be, would be more of a simplistic process. We thought, hey, this equipment, we've been talking about it for years. It, it's probably just sitting on shelves. We only need eight of them. That shouldn't be a problem. Let's just quick order some. We, we didn't have much time to get something set up. And we were shocked to find out that most of the equipment manufacturers were requiring a three-month-plus lead time. Uh, luckily, because of uh, some partnerships that Carnegie Mellon had with Arata Lear at the time, they were able to uh, fast-track some uh, development and have one of the plants make some uh, roadside units, uh, rushed the actual production for us, and shipped it over. So that's how we got that in the roughly the two-and-a-half-week uh, timetable. Uh, consultant support at the time, uh, you know, and it's still still not there. But it, it was it was a struggle. It's still new to everyone. Everyone's learning as they go. So that's something that was just trying to find anyone that had some experience with this to help out, just to move things along. Uh, procurement was an issue. Um, you know, we didn't have proper procurement documents in place. We were just using the the at the time it was the 4.1. Uh, specification or a 4.0 specification. Uh, we didn't have time to go through an RFP process. So what we were able to do is we found out that uh, RADA, uh, CODA, and I believe one other manufacturer are actually on an existing uh, contract, that we, IT contract, that we could access them through. So since we were spending uh, under a certain uh, threshold, we were actually allowed to using uh, a purchase card to just do a PO right off that. So we were you know, lucked out for us just because of the small quantity. That's how we were able to handle our procurement. Um, when we started working with some of these vendors to do the procurement, uh, that was tricky because they didn't realize what we were actually asking for. It was still new to them. They didn't understand exactly what a roadside unit was or you know the function of it. Uh, we we thought just because we had brand new McCain controllers in place that that's all we need to do. We talked to them and they said that you know. Uh, that they could convert things into the J2735. What we didn't realize is you needed to have firmware upgrades on top of that. So we had to work directly with the, the manufacturers to get everything done. Um, we found out that coordination is, is key and critical. If it wasn't for the fact that everyone's willing to hop on almost daily phone calls to make sure everything was on the same page, 
uh, you know, Arata was writing custom code for us to help out. So was McCain at the time. Uh, we wouldn't have been able to do everything as fast as we could. Uh, radio positioning, we, we didn't take that into account when we were first planning this out until we started talking to uh, some of the, the contractors in CMU, trying to figure out the, the best uh, positioning for everything. And then just lack of documentation, something that you know we're happy to see the SPAT challenges really started to address since we did our initial uh, uh, take at this. It, it basically was non-existent at the time. So you still had to basically make things up as you went. Um, which was a great thing to see the SPAT challenge then build off of and, and then to take that to the next step is, is what we're, we wanted to talk about today too was uh, what we view as the next step is the connected fleet challenge. So the connected fleet challenge uh, basically gets fleet owners some experience deploying uh, connected equipment, specifically you know, onboard units within their, their, uh, their vehicle so they have experience in time for when we actually have mass deployment for future fleets. Uh, this will be beneficial because we can actually do some uh, trials of some various application, red light violation warnings, uh, eco glide path, uh, stuff that we can take the existing SPAT message and actually start to try some applications on top of that. Um, infrastructure owner operators that participate in the SPAT challenge, uh, they just need a, a mechanism to perform additional verification for the broadcast, and this would allow for that. Uh, so a lot of deployments are actually going ahead and, and doing onboard units and vehicles to start to prepare. Uh, in our case, one thing I, di I didn't touch on is we didn't have an onboard unit. Uh, CMU did in their vehicle, but they didn't bring it out until the day before to help out with additional verification. We just took a spare roadside unit, reconfigured it, and that's what was uh, uh, receiving the actual uh, SPAT message. We had that hooked up to a computer to verify everything was being received properly, and that's how we did it. We are right now working on our first deployment of an onboard unit in a vehicle, but everything up until now we've just been using a spare roadside unit to actually verify before we can get someone out with an actual equipped vehicle to test. Uh, to give you an idea of the, of the scale of the Connected Fleet Challenge, uh, we view this as public sector fleets are generally not ready for wide-scale deployments, and there are several reasons for this. Limited funds, uh, basically a wait-and-see approach, basically observing other demonstrations and pilot sites and early other uh, deployments, it, it, you know, money is limited, and it, it, it's hard to actually get people to commit uh, enough to just doing the SPAT challenge, but then to start building out fleets, uh, taking uh, vehicles out of commission, it, it's a harder sell. It can be at times, especially depending on the size of the fleet that you're asking for someone to do. Uh, also, there's limited and sometimes no experience in operating onboard units and various types of vehicles. Uh, Blaine will be talking about transit vehicles later, but there's a whole variety of fleets out there. Um, the other thing is that there's a need for an initiative to help the fleet operators gain experience, and this will position them for uh, large-scale deployments, and that's what we view this as the next step. So the goal of the Connected Fleet Challenge is not necessarily quantity, it's diversity. So it's, it's more of quality over quantity type of approach. So ideally, we want numerous uh, variations and models and configurations of both heavy and light duty vehicles uh, for this challenge. Uh, but the, each fleet operator does not need to deploy each of these variations. It's everyone working together, sharing experience, and building off of that is the ultimate goal. So while the SPAT challenge right now is, is tracking actual locations of SPAT messages being broadcast, and for the most part, they're you know, the exact same, the Connected Fleet Challenge is going to take a slightly different approach. It's going to likely look at variations of type of vehicles, whether it be maintenance vehicles, buses, uh, delivery vehicles, passenger vehicles, heavy duty vehicles, et cetera. Basically, what types of onboard units are equipped, any lessons learned, how, you know, the variations between these vehicles, the variations between how things are equipped. That is what's going to be the focus of the Connected Fleet Challenge. Uh, using uh, transit as an example. So we have 10 transit agencies and each equip two of the buses. And this could result in as many as 20 different, uh, different models or configurations of buses. So through a tracking website, you know, we can have the lessons learned, the cost, the installation experiences of each of these could be reported and tracked. So to the industry, this would re represent a substantial percentage of the different types of the buses versus actually having to build out a large fleet so the ultimate goal of this is to gain that experience and that knowledge for each different types. So if we have a variety of, of, 
equipped vehicles, you don't have to have everyone do one of each vehicle. We just have to have someone do it at one point and then share that information. Uh, different, uh, additionally, you know, if we have several school buses and a fleet to participate, this could result in understanding of institutional legal steps uh, required to equip school buses. Uh, that's always seems to be a hot issue, uh, the, you know, I should say a touchy issue, uh, depending on the locality. Um, so that's just another thing that we can work on. Um, one of the goals of the Connected Fleet Challenge is to have the fleet operators equip at least two of their fleet vehicles right now. Uh, a heavy duty and a light duty would be the focus. Uh, we want the fleet operators to collaborate with other fleet operators to achieve as much diversification as possible. And that's going to be done uh, across the nation, and just so you can share. So once again, it's more about quality versus quantity. And also, we want uh, the fleet operators to partner with the infrastructure owner operators that have deployed SPAT and MAP broadcasts so you can have that data exchange to make sure everything's working properly, get lessons learned, figure out how to digest and use this data. So as I mentioned, you know, the, the, the big focus is two vehicles, one heavy duty, one light duty, with an uh, industry focus on diversity, uh, different makes, models, years, different types of vehicles, and you share all those lessons learned. So the, the beauty of the SPAT challenge is that you know, it, it had some basic simplistic uh, focuses, and this can actually build off of those. That really makes things easier. So uh, you know, we, we, can, we can build off the SPAT challenge because we can actually verify everything is being broadcast properly. We can take those messages, as I mentioned before. We can start doing some applications. And then you know, we can actually then start to equip these vehicles to broadcast the basic uh, safety message that allows us as a DOT, as an infrastructure owner operator, to then receive these messages and learn how to actually process them through those connected intersections. Uh, you know, we have benefits to both the infrastructure owner operators and the OEMs, just like the SPAT challenge. We gain experience uh, from the infrastructure owner operator side. Uh, we can test out different applications. We can work on interoperability. We can try out day one applications. And on the flip side, for, uh, for an OEM, you still increase market penetration. Every vehicle that, that we equip through this challenge is one more on, this, on the road. If we're looking at some more of safety critical uh, vehicles, such as snow plows, uh, crash trucks, paint trucks, those types, there's benefits to the OEMs because these are types of vehicles that um, you know, customers probably would like to know about that they're out on the road because it tends to be tied to some sort of uh, mobile operation or, or work that's being done. So there's some benefit then to the OEMs that could then go off to their clients for early deployments. It opens up whole market for aftermarket devices. And it just continues to show support for the whole uh, uh, deployment of DSRC and uh, connected technology. You also, one of the big things we wanted to make sure to do with the Connected Fleet Challenge is keep it simplistic. You, know, you, you have to do this, especially when trying to sell this to leadership. You have to be able to make your elevator speech. So it has to be something that's intuitive, easily understood. So a you know, simple concept is if you're doing V to I, we're doing the I with this bat challenge, but you need that V there. So this is going to start to address that component. And the more deployments that are popping up with bat challenge, we're just not seeing the same numbers uh, pop up with the connected fleet. So this would help to try and, and, and even out those numbers. And unlike the SPAT challenge that was predominantly focused at DOTs and municipalities that own traffic signals, the Connected Fleet Challenge can be more than just DOTs. It opens things up. So logistics-wise, um, we're looking at partnerships between fleet operators and infrastructure owner operators uh, that have participated in the SPAT challenge. Uh, once again, uh, two vehicles, one heavy duty and one light duty, uh, with an onboard unit that can receive the SPAT and MAP message and working to make sure that, and verify and test that the, the SPAT and MAP message are properly being uh, received and processed. And infra infrastructure owner operators then will be working to, uh, with the partners to test and verify communications and develop and receive uh, basic safety messages coming back. So as I mentioned before, it's, it's more than just DOTs. So you have the maintenance fleets that DOTs have, but you can also tie into taxi fleets and transit fleets and emergency first responders. And it doesn't have to be just DOTs. This could be uh, transit authorities. It could be county governments, local governments, you know, police forces, whatever it might be. It opens up the realm when we just start talking about the connected fleet. 
So this just opens up for more partners, more people to get involved in this, in this field, uh, more input, and it'll just help to further things a little bit more. And with that, I believe I'm turning it back over to Blaine. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate uh, that overview of all the stuff you're doing in Pennsylvania and the Fleet Challenge. I think for a lot of people, the Fleet Challenge may be a fairly new topic. It's something we've been kind of playing with and working on for a while. So it's good to um, kind of get that out there, let people start thinking about that. Uh, you made an interesting point towards the end. Um, you know, we're all working on V to I deployment. And ultimately, the SPAT Challenge is really just about the I. But ultimately, we need some Vs. And so that's uh, kind of the next step. That makes some sense. So um, I would like to um, talk a little bit about some of our OBU deployments uh, in Utah. Uh, again, the SPAT challenge is really just about our issues on the roadside broadcasting SPAT and MAP. But as we start looking beyond the SPAT challenge, start looking at things like the uh, Connected Fleet Challenge, um, we want to start understanding how we connect vehicles into this system because that's where we need to ultimately be. So I want to just talk about that a little bit today and some of the work we've done here. And then in future webinars, we'll talk some more about that. Um, just an overview, I'm not going to spend any time talking about our physical deployment here. Uh, but just as a reminder, for those of you who were on the last webinar or have seen presentations from, from me elsewhere, our first deployment uh, was a, um, an 11 mile a state-owned arterial in Salt Lake City called Redwood Road. Um, this 11-mile section has about 30 intersections on it, and we put DSRC devices on 24 of those, uh, actually from four different DSRC manufacturers. Um, the application we decided to run on this corridor, and the original corridor, the idea was, hey, we need to learn how to do this. We need to learn how to hang these and make them work. And while we're at it, let's see if we can uh, put an application on. And so we worked with um, the MITS software, which was written by the University of Arizona for the Connected Vehicle Pooled Fund study, and modified it pretty significantly to work with our bus system. The idea here was to um, connect some buses from our transit agency, the Utah Transit Authority, or UTA, and allow them to request priority at the intersections when they're late. And the late criteria is five minutes. So and they're five minutes behind published schedule at certain key time points along the corridor, they are then subsequently allowed to ask for priority at those intersections. Um, and the signal controller um, will decide whether it can grant priority or not. A little extra, a little early green time, a little late green time. And our goal was to increase schedule reliability of those, of those buses from their, their state at the time we started this project, about 86% reliable to about 94% re reliable. And um, early indications have shown um, that we're doing that. Um, we've been operating this since November, and we're getting that kind of benefit out of schedule reliability. Um, we currently only have four buses running on the corridor that are equipped. Um, and we're just getting ready to equip maybe six or eight more buses here as soon as we can uh, get schedules lined up. So um, that's sort of the background on the deployment itself. Um, so um, onboard installation is different from every for every vehicle. And Mark Kopko talked about that. Um, every, every different vehicle has a little different system. And so it, it gives us sort of a new challenge. Um, every vehicle is a little bit different. Um, one, of the, one of the key elements of that is the power system. Um, it, most of these onboard units are 12-volt DC systems. Um, some vendors have an ignition and a power line. Some don't. And you may need some other DC to DC system if the vehicle you're putting this on isn't a 12-volt system. Um, or if you have other devices that require other voltage. We, as I'll talk about in a minute, used a Linux um, coprocessor board, um, uh, a single board computer, to run all of our software. And it's a 5-volt DC system. And so um, you've got to deal with those kinds of things as you look at um, at power. Now, um, today I also, I, I failed to recognize this, I also have Johnny Turner with me. Johnny is with the Narwhal Group. He's our consultant that has 
um, worked on this project with us uh, since the beginning, and uh, everyone. And we're going to sort of tag team this, and so I'll present some of the information, and Johnny will occasionally jump in, and I think right now he's going to jump in and, and clarify some things on the power system. Yeah, I just wanted to add in here that um, the power systems, and especially fleet vehicles like buses, that are more complex and have equipment and systems running on them are a little bit more elaborate than just a vehicle that turns off and they have shutdown periods and have equipment that has to be gracefully shut down. So as you do installations on these types of fleets, to be sure to be aware of those kinds of things. And if your OBE equipment needs to have graceful shutdown periods or your applications need graceful shutdowns, those kinds of things. Um, the uh, coordination with those fleet managers or owners is definitely a key uh, to making sure that you have uh, reliability in your system once it's in an operational state. So um, here's a, a couple of early typical photos of installation on one of these UTA buses. There's one of the buses there. <clears throat> fairly late model buses manufactured in about 2012. Um, we have an onboard unit. Well, first of all, you notice that, that there's a, an electronics cabinet. It's mounted behind the driver, um, and that's where all of their radio systems, computer systems, and everything else that they have on board the bus is, is housed. And so the transit agency allowed us uh, to go into that cabinet and take up a little real estate in the cabinet. Um, you can see in the center photograph there, they've got slide-out drawers, and we were able to put our equipment on there. In this particular photograph, there's a, the, the blue device is the CODA DSRC onboard unit. Um, next to that, in that um, kind of funny-shaped uh, white case, is our BeagleBoard onboard Linux processor. Um, and then there's a power supply unit. And then um, I'll talk about antenna a little bit later, but... Um, antenna we wired from this cabinet up into uh, the enclosure above the driver's head. You can see on the photograph of the bus on the far left side, there's a little bulging fiberglass piece on the front of the bus. Not exactly sure why it's there, but our antenna is inside of that um, rather than being penetrated out on the outside of the bus. Um, so the onboard equipment is secured to this equipment drawer and Johnny will talk a little bit about uh, the equipment. This is, a, this is a picture of a later installation. You'll see in this case um, the um, onboard unit is a Lear onboard unit. Um, and Johnny will talk a little bit about uh, some of the issues here. So there's a lot of equipment, as you see there. And they have a full-blown mobile data computer that's operating in there, as well as the rest of their entire network. And so you need to be careful as you're, well, one, you have to kind of beg for space in, in this environment. And UTA was gracious enough to give us the adequate space that we needed. Uh, we have to have our onboard processor not only for uh, running our applications, but also to obtain interfaces to the outside world, so to speak. So in this cabinet, we're obtaining data from the mobile data computer that's, that's owned by the transit authority and using that data as part of our application and, and how our system runs. So a lot of um, coordination needs to occur there. But basically, the buses have a lot of routing and path to get your antennas and power and things installed in, in a very nice and pretty way. But um, it's key to coordinate with the transit authority or the fleet owner to make sure that everything goes in here and that you have reliable power systems and again that you are tying to the right power systems as you do that. Um, we also installed a bracket that covers up the power button on our OBU so that as people opened and closed these cabinets as you can see they roll out they didn't inadvertently shut the power off to um, the unit and that we made sure we had sufficient cabling and it was managed so that as the, the drawers were pulled in and out, there was not any damage to coax cables for the DSRC or other um, network and power infrastructure in there. Because these buses are 
as, as you can imagine, quite uh, an expensive asset that they have. So um, and there's a lot of money sitting inside this cabinet, so it's just key to make sure everything's nice, neat, and uh, operational. So here's a, another photo of those um, devices placed on the shelf in the bus cabinet. As Johnny indicated, there's a mobile data computer system in the bus. Uh, since we're giving priority to the buses only when they're late, we need to know when they're late. And so one of the reasons we connect to the mobile data computer system um, uh, on the UTA network is to, is to query it about whether the bus is late or not. Um, and so we needed to connect to that. The bus has its own dedicated network, and we had to work pretty closely with the IT staff of the transit agency in order to figure out what that data looked like and how to get at it and then modify our software to query it appropriately and use the data. Um, and um, so there were a lot of interactions going on based on those kinds of things. Clearly, depending on the kind of application you're trying to run and the kind of vehicle you're tying to and who owns it and what you're doing, those are unique nuances that you have to figure out for each type of installation. And, and we spent a fair amount of time sort of sorting through that. And the transit agency was very flexible and helpful. There's just some details we had to work through. Um, another thing about the installation that um, maybe is obvious if you think about it, but these buses run all day. And we needed to be able to get on these buses for a period of time uh, to install this equipment. Well, that happened in the middle of the night because that's when the buses were in the shop um, getting cleaned and whatever else and, and not in service. So rather than take the buses out of service, uh, Johnny's team had to coordinate uh, with the transit authority to be able to get in there in their shops at night uh, to, uh, to put in the equipment. So some of those kinds of things uh, need to be thought through. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the antennas um, are are installed up in the fiberglass housing. Uh, we were first uh, a little concerned about whether the antenna would get reception uh, up there, not exposed to the atmosphere, if you will. And and, and we have not had problem with that. It, it, the, the signal penetrates the fiberglass pretty well. Uh, Johnny's going to talk about um, a couple of other issues with the antennas here uh, relative to placement. Yeah, so as was mentioned by Mark, the you need to have some sort of RF theory in mind as you deploy not only the roadside but the onboard units. And a lot of the antennas require um, ground planes in order for the waves to propagate correctly because as these are omnidirectional antennas, they don't have as much gain in a single direction as a directional antenna does. And so it's important to get as much out of your onboard antenna as you possibly can. And so it's really important to note whether your antenna requires a ground plane or not. So we'll see in a later slide on the, a different bus where it will mount to an enclosure that will have a, that will serve as a ground plane. But that's definitely a, a consideration that must be made and you will have really diminished range if your antenna requires a ground plane and you don't have one. Um, some of the DSRC units require two radios instead of, excuse me, two antennas per radio instead of one to provide diversity. Uh, we've talked with some vendors and they indicate that you only need, um, well, sorry, the OBUs that only require two antennas, you can leave the other leads um, available for future deployment. There's no need to you know, cut them off or get a different antenna if your DSRC unit only requires two antennas instead of four. So we actually have that situation where we have different OBUs that require different antenna amounts, and we just leave the others in the event that a different OBU is, is going to be placed. And it doesn't require that the antenna is shorted or anything special. It doesn't adversely affect the operation of the radio. So it's kind of a rule of thumb for us. We're approaching installing four um, lead antennas for our OBUs so that we're kind of future-proofing what we've got. So there's another subtlety involved in what Johnny just talked about. Um, some onboard units have actually two DSRC units in them. 
Um, that's why you'd have four antennas, and some only have two. So depending on the kind of application you're running, you need to think through um, whether you need an OBU with two DSRC radios or one. And, and, and we've purchased both sort of inadvertently. Um, uh, our MITS application really prefers to have the two radios, and so that's generally what we've bought. Um, so that's sort of the installation on these um, regular transit buses. I want to clarify one thing about how we're operating here and, and make sure that, that people understand um, sort of an apples and oranges question. Um, the primary message you're sending from a vehicle is the basic safety message. Basic safety message is defined by SAE in the J2735 specification, and, um, and that's what all of our vehicles will need to be broadcasting. In addition to that, based on our application, we're broadcasting a signal request message to get signal priority. But the BSM, as, as its title is, is the basic message that needs to be sent. The BSM has a part one and a part two, and it has mandatory elements and optional elements, and, and there's a lot of detail in there. Uh, but um, we are not connecting to the, the CAN unit in the physical bus, if you will. And so there are things that you would normally get out of the vehicle itself um, and broadcast um, if you were connected into the vehicle CAN. Um, and, um, and we're not doing that. So um, here on the display, here on this slide is in kind of the black and purplish blue are, are the, the basic required elements of the part one of the basic safety message. And you'll notice at the bottom things like braking status, vehicle size, turning angle of the steering wheel. We don't know any of that because we're not tied into the can of the bus itself. Um, the items in the red boxes are things that we are getting and broadcasting. And all of these are available either through the GPS system um, or some other way that we've, um, that we've obtained them. So um, in the lowest red box, speed and heading, that comes out of the GPS system. Latitude, longitude, elevation comes out of the GPS system. And the GPS is part of the onboard unit. Um, uh, there's a time stamp. And the D second or the sec mark um, near the top there is um, essentially the time stamp. And it's not quite that simple, but that's what it is. Um, and then um, there's a message count, which is just a sequential numbering system. But you'll notice in here an ID. It's a vehicle ID. And under normal circumstances, that temporary vehicle ID is random. And it's intended that way so that the vehicle can't be tracked. If you're putting uh, an OBU on a regular passenger vehicle, it's broadcasting the safety message with location and speed and heading and all of those kinds of things. Intentionally, the automakers don't want that vehicle to be um, identified. There's no VIN, there's no make and model or color or plate or any of that. So they assign it a temporary ID because you need, you need some kind of an ID, of, ID for using the data. In our particular case, um, we've got uh, these buses and they're fixed buses and we're comparing our data to data in the transit system to understand if, they're, if we're improving their schedule reliability. We needed to know exactly which bus it is. And so we've gone in and modified the BSM message so that the bus number, and you can't read the number, but I've got a little box on the picture of the bus there. There's a little five -dig, four or five digit number that, that defines the number of that bus. And um, we needed that. So we've gone into the software and replaced the ID, the temporary ID, with a fixed bus number. Um, so that's a lot of description about something that may not be terribly important, but as we look at equipping vehicles, and particularly if you look at the fleet challenge, um, we're actually not totally connected to the vehicle because we're not broadcasting some of those basic elements and, and don't yet have any experience to share about how you would get that information off of the bus. Um, other people would, but that's just not someplace we are yet. So um, we've moved on to another corridor now, and we're, we're now um, implementing this software system on a second corridor. This is different in that it's a brand new bus rapid transit line in Provo and Orem, which is about 40 miles south of Salt Lake City. And for about 50% of its route, this bus rapid transit line is in dedicated lane, and the other part it's not. Um, this system has 47 intersections and 25 buses. They run these buses pretty close together. Um, and, um, and we're in the middle of installing this system now. Um, 
they had a soft opening this week, actually, yesterday. So when I show an August 18th completion here, that's when the buses started running. But unfortunately, the physical infrastructure isn't finished yet, the bus stops and some of the lanes and, and things. And so our TSP system is not yet operational, and, and we're in the middle of getting it to be that way. Uh, but in this case, um, we'll outfit all 25 of these articulated buses. In fact, the, the equipment has already been installed on the buses and the intersections. And um, they will um, run down the corridor and, again, request priority when the buses are late. There aren't a lot of things that are different about this installation than the one we just described on Redwood Road with traditional buses, uh, but the antenna placement is a little different uh, because there's the, the roof of the bus is different. And so Johnny's going to spend just a second talking about the installation of, uh, of the antenna on the roof. And here you've got a couple of shots of the photos of, of the roof and what it looks like. Johnny, we do not hear you if you're talking. I think there is a problem with his audio. I'm going to resolve that in a second. I'm wondering if Johnny has lost connection. Can you hear Johnny now? Hang on just a second. Sorry. So as I mentioned earlier, the cabinets on the top of this bus are custom developed for antennas. And you can see that there's different boxes for antennas. The, an the bus has a GPS and also cell antennas and different things up there. And they left a space. That second one in, you can see, is for the placement of the DSRC antenna. This was before it went in. And this, is, this will support a ground plane very well because of those metal enclosures. So I just wanted to point that out and mention that that's um, how we'd go about doing that. So um, the third project we're working on, we're equipping vehicles, is a little different. Um, we've decided that as long as we had um, RSUs installed on a corridor, we would start looking at other uses uh, for that equipment. And um, we've decided to outfit some snow plows. Um, and we've picked additional corridors. Um, for a snowplow preemption system. The concept here is that the plow would actually be able to preempt the signal and get a green light when it's actually plowing snow. So we've selected five cores, corridors in Salt Lake Valley, and, which include Redwood Road. Um, and that will, that will have us installing 55 new intersections with DSRC equipment um, and 46 plows from five different maintenance sheds located around the valley that, that belong to the DOT. And um, the plan here is to improve safety by getting the roads um, cleared more quickly. Um, that's sort of the goal here. Um, the metric is a little harder to follow, a little harder to figure out. But that's, that's the goal. Um, and the plan is to have these five corridors outfitted uh, before snow starts to fly this, this coming winter. So we're actively working on that now. And we have um, gone in and started to play with um, installing the equipment in the, in the plows and, 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 again, needing to find out um, when they're actually plowing. It turns out that finding out whether the blade is up or down was not a trivial thing. Uh, but it was fairly easy to find out whether the, whether the spreader on the back of the truck is turned on or turned off. And so we're actually monitoring the spreader. Um, our assumption, I think it's a valid assumption, is that if the spreader's on, the plow's probably down. They're actually probably plowing. And so um, that's what we're, what we're doing. Um, so Johnny's got um, a little bit he wanted to talk about relative to um, this installation. Oh. It's just interesting to note here that the snow plows are going to expand the usage of the DSRC on Redwood Road. And so we are going to, what we do is we filter by vehicle type. Um, so the buses are going to be running down this corridor, and the plows are going to be running down this corridor. And so the roadside equipment distinguishes by vehicle type, whether it's a plow or it's a bus. And different calls are made to the traffic signal based on 
the different vehicle types, and that can easily be extended to emergency vehicles. So it's just a nuance of and kind of expansion of the system to be able to support a variety of vehicle types. So um, the vehicle has, um, the plow has equipment in it that operates the uh, plow control systems, and it's, uh, it's manufactured by Force America. Um, Johnny will talk a little bit about uh, these systems, um, how we connected to them, and the uh, antennas, antenna placement in these trucks. So the controller units in the plows, again, the plows are quite advanced and complex in nature and so we actually worked with Force America and they were able to give us an output out of their controller that would throw 24 volts when the spreader went live and we use that output from their controller to then tie to our Linux processor so we built a custom board that would take an input from the plow controller and basically be used as an on-off switch to the system so that it could um, turn on priority or preemption and off again. And so that's really the approach that we did. We're talking to three different plow controller units, and we wanted to place the antenna on the roof of the truck, but we're discouraged by maintenance. The plows are in very rugged environments with the brine and the weather that they didn't want to do a roof penetration. And so for now, we've done a dash mount, and we've been able to get the range necessary to run the programs and get the preemption spacing that we need to adequately notify the traffic signal. And that's really kind of the key, again, it's important to work with the fleet owners, in this case it's UDOT, but the different plow foremen so that they understand what's going on. And then our board also has the capability to be able to close a contact to turn on a dash light or something else if you want to provide driver feedback to let them know that the system's in operation. Um, and then finally, on the plow installation, what we did is we fabricated a backplate um, with the, our onboard processor, the OBU, and any other contacts necessary. Like I mentioned, the Force America equipment outputs a 24-volt signal to us. We then run that through a dry contact relay and feed that into our onboard processor. And we did this kind of format for a couple of reasons, but the biggest one was we needed something that would be robust, could be installed in the truck in a flat uh, form factor, and then something that could be installed quickly and easily. So we can just take this whole back panel, we mount it to um, the bulkhead behind the passenger seat, and then we just have to connect to the vehicle's power to the output of the Force America controller and then place the antenna and everything self-contained and uh, nice and neat and out of the way so that it won't be damaged and can be verified and tested as necessary. So that's our uh, summary of, of installing OBUs in these different kinds of vehicles. Hopefully there was something in there that was helpful. And uh, I'll turn the time back over to Nilo. Thanks, Lane. Um, so it's time for question and answer. Um, I do see uh, one or two questions coming, but please uh, put in your questions, anything that you have for Blaine, Johnny, or Mark, type them down in the question discussion pod here now. Um, so the first question is for Blaine, and the question is how, um, how do I understand uh, that it's not your, it's not using the CAN interface at all, and just depending on the OBU GPS? Uh, and also, the follow-up question is also how were you able to modify the OBU temporary ID as part of the basic safety message? 
So the first question, that's true. We're not using the CAN interface at all. We're depending on just the GPS in the OBU uh, to get the data that we need on vehicle location and, and speed and all of that stuff. I'm going to let Johnny tackle the question about how we modified the temporary ID and the BSM. So there's actually two approaches that we made. In the case of the CODA equipment, we generate the BSM and do everything in order to make create that message so we have the, the kind of capability to generate the vehicle ID on our onboard processor. And so that's what we do with that vendor. With the Lear equipment, we use the BSM generated there and the vehicle ID generated there, and they actually have um, – uh, place in in their firmware where you can go in and you can enter a custom vehicle ID um, just directly um, in their hardware itself. Okay, any more questions? All right. Um, so not seeing anyone typing any questions. Uh, I guess uh, we don't have a lot of questions for this session today. Um, I don't know if Blaine, Johnny, or Mark has anything to add, uh, any closing thoughts, or just uh, comments for the participants before I close off the webinar. No, I think we're we're good on the Utah end. If anybody has any questions about this that come up later, feel free to, to reach out, and we appreciate everybody being on the call today and participating. Okay, great. Um, so I, I really want to thank Blaine, Johnny, and Mark for helping us with this webinar today. Again, uh, this was recorded and uh, will be available soon on our website. Um, and will be sent to you uh, as a follow-up email. Um, on behalf of National Operations Center of Excellence and our presenters, thank you for joining us today, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you.